Hi, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Daniel Karapkin speaking to you from the Bayit Beth Avram Yosef of Toronto. Uh, we're, we've been studying Moren Nevuchim now for uh, a couple of years, and uh, we are coming towards the end of the first section of Moren Nevuchim. Um, uh, we are starting chapter 70 today. Uh, we are using the Shlomo Pines edition of Moren Nevuchim, which is readily accessible as the guide of the perplexed. Um, and we are on page 171. Uh, to be able to get our bearings as far as where we are at, at this point, I just want to review what we've studied uh, from chapter 69 over the last couple of weeks. The Rambam launched into a very philosophical discussion, and I, by philosophical I mean Aristotelian philosophical discussion, about God being what's known as the cause of all of existence. And he used an Aristotelian concept called the four causes. And God ultimately is the prime cause using those four definitions of the word cause. Um, and the reason why the Rambam finds himself in this uh, discussion at this particular point is because he is polemicizing against a, a group of Philosoph religious philosophers of his times, known as the Midabrim or the Mutakalimun, uh, who also uh, undertake a very similar project as the Rambam, which is to reconcile uh, faith with reason, or to reconcile their religious beliefs, in this case they are Muslim thinkers, to reconcile their Muslim faith and their philosophy of Aristotelianism. The Mutakalimun uh, find that it is not possible to reconcile Aristotle as much as the Rambam does, and therefore they reject much of Aristotelian thought, and the Rambam finds himself having to defend Aristotle against religious thought. And this is his project in chapter 69, and really the last eight chapters of the first section of Moren Nebuchim. Now, in the last chapter, what we saw was that the Rambam helped define Aristotle's four causes. And uh, he said that in the using the definition of the word cause, God fits three out of those four definitions of being the ultimate or prime cause of all that exists. God, he said, is the efficient cause, which means that if you look at a chain of events and you want to know what is the thing that uh, that created or, or was responsible for the ultimate result, that is ultimately God. There, you know, the carpenter is the efficient cause of the existence of a table or a chair because he manufactures the chair. But if you go back and you say, well, how did the carpenter get his ideas? And how did the carpenter come into existence? And you go back to a chain that goes all the way back leading to God who is the uncaused cause or the ultimate cause, the first cause. God is also known as the formal cause. And uh, as being the formal cause, that means that God imbues everything that exists with its form, which means the its, its features other than the, the matter or material that it is made out of. And we talked about that last week as well. And finally, God is the end cause or the objective of the universe is for the sake of God, and that's another cause. Now, I want to point out that the fourth cause that Aristotle talked about is the material cause. And when we talk about the material cause, it means what is responsible for all of the matter in contradistinction to the form of the thing that is sit standing here right in front of us that I'm looking at. So, for example, if I have a table and I want to know how the table received its form, it's from the mind of the carpenter. But if we move it back even further, how did the idea get into the mind of the carpenter? Ultimately, we will get back to a chain of, of causes that leads to God. But what about the material, the wood that this table is made out of? How did it get here? So that's the only um, cause, that's what we call the material cause, and that is the only uh, association that the Rambam did not create to God. And as we pointed out last time, 
the Rambam's major project throughout the first section is to deny any kind of corporeality to God, and therefore he cannot bring himself to say that God is the cause of matter, that God is the efficient cause or, uh, or the material cause of matter that exists in this world. You know, when it even came to talking about God as the formal cause on page 169 of chapter 69, the Rambam had also pointed out that God is not like other kinds of things that imbue matter with form, right? God imbues the entire universe with its form, but God is not like other things that, are, that imbue matter with form, because form cannot exist without matter. They have to be joined together in order to comprise something that is existent. But God is not obligated to conjoin himself with anything in order for God to have purpose and existence and meaning. And so in that sense, the Rambam even distances God from form. Uh, so now it is certainly true that God is going to distance himself from matter, which is um, a, a negation of God's corp uh, non-corporeality. So in chapter 70, the Rambam has to address how Aristotle's definition of the four causes fits with God in some way. And so he's going to point out that there is another way of describing God using an Aristotelian a nomenclature, and that instead of saying that God is the cause of all matter, we can say that God is the mover or the first mover, or another term would be the unmoved mover of all that exists, even all of the matter, the physical stuff that exists in our universe. And that's the objective of chapter 70. Um, some of you who have, may have studied philosophy in uh, university may be familiar with uh, Thomas Aquinas's five ways or five arguments for the existence of God. And uh, Aquinas, who lives just shortly after the Rambam, is also an Aristotelian and he takes his cues from Aristotle's uh, philosophical definitions of God as well. And uh, the first two uh, arguments of uh, Aquinas's five ways is that God is the unmoved mover and that God is the prime cause. So the Rambam in chapter 69 has defined God as the prime cause, the uncaused cause or the first cause. And now he's going to, for the sake of being able to fit in God to the how God associates with the material of this universe, he's going to define God as the unmoved or the first mover. But he's not going to say that God is the ultimate cause of material, although even though, in a sense, that happens to be the reality. Now, how is he going to do that? So it's important to note that the Aristotelian philosophy of the Rambam's time was linked to another type school of philosophy called Neoplatonism, which very much subscribed to the belief that there are concentric spheres, transparent spheres that surround our planet, and that there are a series of emanations that come from uh, up high to the supreme being, to the prime cause or the, or the first mover, and those emanations um, make their way down uh, to our world. And all that exists in our world is a product of those concentric spheres which all are filtering, or in some way processing and then filtering and perhaps altering the emanations that come from the prime cause. And that's how we end up with the universe that we find ourselves in this material universe, which while acknowledging that it is a, a product of God, but at the same time, we also acknowledge that it is unlike God in many ways, because this is a material universe and God is immaterial. So how, did, how does, a, an, an, an immaterial, non-corporeal God become responsible for a corporeal world? And the answer is, is that it's through a process of emanations that through each sphere that filters this emanation ultimately from God, there is an alteration, a distortion, a mutation that brings us to this flawed and imperfect world, even though it originated in a perfect God. And, and, that's, and the, we talk about the movement of the celestial bodies in these spheres as being responsible for causing all of that which exists to function in the way that it functions. Because motion is associated with existence. And when something is not in motion, it can also cease to exist. And so therefore that's 
that's the that's the mindset that the Rambam is utilizing in this chapter. So let's get started with the text. And it's quite interesting that the Rambam goes back to a style that he had used all uh, throughout the first part of the first section, which is to take a noun or a verb which appears in Tanakh to point out to us that when it applies to God, it does not mean the same thing as when it is applied to the material world and human beings. Um, and that seems to indicate to us that the Rambam is continuing his project of distancing corporeality from God, which is sort of like consistent with what we've said, is that this chapter is a continuation of the previous chapter. Knowing that I've only assigned God as three out of the four causes, and fitting God into those three out of four categories of cause, now I have to use this chapter to allude to the fact in sort of in, a, in an esoteric way how God is the material cause, but instead of calling him the cause, I will call him the mover and describe him in that way. So we use the, the verb resh chaf bet, rachov, and now I'm going to share a screen so that we can have some, uh, um, this handout is available. Uh, if you'd like to download it, you can download it from uh, the Facebook group Shi'ur in Morena Vuchim, or for those of you who are enrolled in the webyeshiva.org course, uh, which is the platform through which we are giving these shiurim, and it is the sponsor of this shiur, um, you can uh, look at the uh, course description, and you can download the handout from there. Now, this word is equivocal, which means that it means different things depending upon how it is utilized. To be rochev uh, in Hebrew means to ride. A rechev is a car, rakevet is a train. These are these are modes of transport. The first instance in which it is used means man's riding in the usual manner on beasts. He was riding upon his donkey, right? This is reference to Bil'am, v'hu rochev al atono. Afterwards, it is used figuratively to designate domination over a thing, for a rider dominates over and rules that which he rides. And that, of course, is the way we're going to describe God as a rider of this universe. And um, thus the dictum, Yarkivehu al bomote aretz, that God causes the Jewish people to ride on the high places of the earth. It's not, the image is not that we're sitting on a mountain with a saddle on it. That's not what the Pusuk means, but rather, and again, another similar Pusuk in Isaiah, that vihir um, kavticha al bomote aretz. What do these words mean? Meaning that you shall dominate the heights of the earth. And similarly, I will make Ephraim ride in the book of Hosea, chapter 10. That is, I shall make him dominate and rule. In this sense, it is said of God, because God is not a, a corporeal being that can be positioned spatially on top of something else. But rather, when we use the word rochev about God, it, it, it is said, may he be exalted, the rider of the heavens is helping you, um, which, is, uh, which is a verse from Deuteronomy, chapter 33. Ein kakel Yeshurun, there is no God like Jeshurun, rochev shamayim be'ezrecha, that God is riding the heavens to come to your aid. So we'll see what that means exactly, that God is the rider of the heavens. But as we'll see, it means that God is moving the celestial bodies and is controlling them in order to bring about results in this world that, he, that will come to the aid of the Jewish people. He who dominates the heavens. Similarly, the rochev uh, Ba'aravot, as it appears in Psalms in Tehillim chapter 68, meaning, meaning he who dominates the highest heaven encompassing the universe. The textual words of the sages, may their memory be blessed, which are repeated in every relevant passage, assert that there are seven heavens and that Aravot is the highest encompassing the universe. And here, the Rambam feels that it's quite important to go into an exposition of a passage from Tractate Chagiga, chapter 12b, which describes the structure of the celestial um, uh, framework, the, the different levels of, of uh, rakia, the different levels of heaven. Now, uh, we'll just read a little bit, a few snippets of this Gemara. If you take a look in source number seven on your screen, Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Shenei Rakiim Heim, there are two layers of heaven, or two layers of celestial uh, um, tears or, or uh, strata. Shenemar, hein la shemelokecha hashamayim ushme hashamayim. 
So Rev, Rev Yehuda looks at one Pasuk and he says, there are two levels of heaven. There's what's called Shamayim, sky, and the sky of the skies. Those are the two levels. But Reish Lakish Omer, and this is the opinion that the Rambam is sticking with, is that Shiva, there are seven heavens. And of course, you know that this is a phrase not only from Judaism, but in Christianity as well. Ve'eluhein, Vilon, Rakia, Shechakim, Zavul, Machon, Ma'on, Machon, Aravot. So the seven levels, each one has a different name. And the highest level of heaven is called Aravot. Now, normally, as Pines points out, the word Aravot means a plain, like in a desert or in a field, in a, in a valley. But that's not what it means over here. Um, the word Aravot is a reference to a, a certain strata, strata, stratum within the, within the heavenly dimension. And the Gemara now tells us we're skipping a lot of the Gemara because the Gemara basically goes through the first six strata of heaven, tells us what its function is, what is contained within that stratum. And now we're going to skip to go to Aravot. And what is contained in Aravot? Shabot Sedek, Mishpat Utzdaka. Contained in Aravot is justice, um, uh, jurisprudence, and charity. Perhaps that would be one way or, yeah. Ginze chayim viginze shalom viginze bracha, storehouses of life, storehouses of peace, and storehouses of blessing. Vinishmatan shel tzadikim, the souls of the righteous dwell in that stratum. Viruchot unishamot sha'atid lihibaraot, and all different kinds of spirits and souls that will eventually be created, even those that have not been created, that have not come to life yet. Vital. And the do that God will eventually use to resurrect the dead. So that's all. It's very, very cryptic, obviously. What does it mean? So the Rambam is going to try and explain this to us. We're going to skip down to uh, where the Gemara continues this discussion, and it says, Sham ofanim usrafim v'chayot ha-kodesh. Therein, in the Aravot, you can also find all of these kinds of celestial angels, Ofanim, Serafim, and Chayot Kodesh, which are terms that we may be familiar from in our prayers, Umalachei Asherit, and ministering angels, Vikisei HaKavod, and the throne of glory, which of course is a very important uh, um, icon in Tanakh for the Rambam, because it is part of what we call the Maase Merkava, but it's the divine throne. Melech Kel Ram Vinisa Shochen Alehem Ba'aravot. And the king, uh, God, who is alive and exalted and elevated, dwells over all of these that we've just mentioned that are contained in Aravot. Shanemar Solu Lerochev Ba'aravot Bikashemo. As the Pasuk in Tehillim says, that uh, give, uh, uh, ascribe loftiness to he who rides on the heavens. Uminalan de Ikru Shamaim, and how do we know that Aravot is a, a heavenly stratum? And the Gemara explains it's based upon creating a scriptural connection between the word Rochev, Shamayim, and Rochev Ba'aravot. And so if God is described as a rider of Shamayim and is described as a rider of Aravot, it stands to reason that Aravot is some stratum within this heavenly dimension. Okay. So now we continue in the text of the Rambam, now that we know what uh, the piece of Gemara, of Talmud, that the Rambam is quoting, and he says as follows, um, do not think it blameworthy that according to their reckoning there were seven heavens. And here the Rambam basically says, now you may be aware of the um, philosophical model of how many strata of celestial spheres exist, and it's not consistent with seven. Uh, there are different models. Some say there are 10, and others say there are 40. And the Rambam just wants to dispel the, inc the incompatibility between these two systems where the rabbis say there are only seven. And the point that he makes is, don't, don't, make, don't make that a sticking issue, because at the end of the day, there are different ways of classifying the different strata. And what may be 10 for one is because they break down one stratum into different levels. And the rabbis are aware of those breakdowns as well, but they classify it in seven because each stratum may contain substrata as well. So he's not worried about the 
about the um, perhaps the different num system of numbering because they all mean the same thing. But then he goes on and he says, what intended, and we're on page 172, is what is intended here is to call attention to the fact that they constantly indicate that Aravot is the highest part of the universe. It is with reference to Aravot um, that, is, that it says the writer of the heavens is helping you. Compare the text of Chagiga where they say, as to Aravot, the high and sublime one resides upon it, for it is said, extol the writer in the Aravot. And he just quotes the Gemara. Thus it is clear that the term refers solely only, only to one particular stratum of heaven, that which encompasses the entire universe, and God ultimately is the highest above all of the different celestial spheres, and the highest of the celestial spheres is known as Aravot in Talmudic nomenclature. About that heaven, you will hear some information. And basically what the Rambam is saying is, I'm foreshadowing you now that when we get to some ensuing chapters, particularly chapter 72, I'm going to talk about more what the function of this highest of heavens is. Now, he says, consider, but what for our purposes now, he says, let's go back to that verb, rochev. What does it mean? Consider they're saying that God resides upon it. They did not say that God resides in it. For if they had said resides in it, this expression would have necessitated the attribution to him of a place or the notion that he is a force subsisting in a certain place. And God does not subsist in any place, as we've spoken about in a number of chapters previously in the first section of Moreh Nebuchim. And therefore the Rambam says the Sabaeans, which was an ancient people that are live in the biblical period, who believed in uh, the stars, as being the ultimate arbiters of everything that happens, the celestial bodies as being the arbiters of everything that happens in our universe, he says they imagine that God is a spirit contained within the heavens, almost like a pantheistic philosophy, that there is a godlike force that is driving all of the celestial bodies, but that's not how Judaism views God. As a matter of fact, that's the difference between idolatry and the view of God contained in the Torah is that um, idolatry says that the celestial bodies are endowed with independent uh, deity power, and Judaism says that, no, that there is a mover of all of the celestial bodies who controls them, and that ultimately is one being known as the Ribbono Shalolam. Thus, by saying resides upon it, they have shown that he may he be exalted is separate from the heaven and is not a force in it. And then he, then he says that to consider the following, know that the expression rochev ba'aravot or rochev ba'shamayim, that God is the rider of the heavens, is figuratively used of him, may he be exalted, for the sake of a strange and wondrous likeness. And then he makes two points. Number one, for the rider is more excellent than that upon which he rides, yet cannot be called more excellent except through a certain impropriety of language, for the rider does not belong to the same species as that which that which is ridden by him. We cannot say that a human being is better than a horse, because there really is no comparison between human beings and horses. There are two completely different categories of being. But what we can say is that the human being controls the horse and dominates the horse. And that's the way that the Tanakh wishes us to envision God as the, the ultimate being who is in complete control and domination of everything that occurs beneath the seven heavens. And the second point that he wants to make is, moreover, the rider is he who makes the beast of burden move and go where he wishes, for it is an instrument for him that he uses as he wishes, being at the same time free from any dependence on it and not attached to it, but on the contrary, external to it. And so the person who rides the horse controls the direction of the horse, can tell the horse where to go, but in no way is connected to the horse. He can completely detach himself from the horse at any time he so wishes. So that's the reason why God is called a rider, as is now he's going to point out. The objective is to ascribe to Hashem uh, the complete control and complete disconnection that God has from all that exists in creation. Similarly, the deity, may his name be held sublime, is the mover of the highest heaven, by whose motion everything that is in motion within the heaven is moved. In other words, God is the mover of all that exists. And through that motion, matter comes into existence, as the Rambam will describe in the ensuing few chapters 
that we're going to see. So therefore, in a sense, the Rambam has ultimately said that God is the material cause of the of all matter that exists in the universe. But instead of saying that God is the material cause, he says that God is the mover and his motion of the celestial bodies gives rise to matter. So it is one more step re of removing or distancing HaKadosh Baruch Hu from anything having to do with matter. At the same time, he may be uh, may he be exalted is separate from this heaven and not a force subsisting within it. Accordingly, the sages interpreting his speech, may he be exalted, uh, say that the eternal God is a dwelling place. And here we um, we go to a pasuk now, source number eight. We say the pasuk says meona eloke kedem, that the eternal God is a place meona or is a repository. And we may be familiar with this medrash because um, it is quoted in a number of different places throughout uh, um, our more well-known literature. The, to the, the Torah says in reference to Yaakov, Vayifgaba Makom, that as Yaakov was leaving Eretz Yisrael right before he has his dream with the ladder, it says he arrived at the place. And the word Makom is quite significant for our sages because not God is known as Makom, it's one of God's names. And therefore, the Medrash points out in source number nine, Rav Huna b'shem Rabbi Ami Omar Mipnei Ma Mechanin Shemo Shel HaKadosh Baruch Hu B'Korin Oto Makom. Why is it that we give God the appellation of Makom, the place? And the reason is, Shuhu Mekomo Shel Olam Ve'ein Olamo Mekomo. Because God is the place of the world, and the world is not God's place. Now, the, the, this is derived not only from the fact that it says, bamakom, that Yaakov came to the place where God, re, where God sort of establishes that as he is the place, because Yaakov is having a divine encounter. It also says it in, uh, in Parshat Kitisa, in Exodus chapter 33, where God says, Hine makomiti. Moshe, you're about to have a divine encounter. You're about to have a very esoteric understanding of divinity. And God says the same thing. There is a place here. Basically, the word place means that I'm going to give you a, an encounter with divinity, with, with a face-to-face -face kind of encounter with God. And we have the same principle that is derived according to Rabbi Yitzchak from the words, Me'ona Eloke Kedem. We don't know from this verse whether God is the place of the world or the world is God's place or God's residence. And therefore the Pasuk says that God is the repository for the world instead of the world being the repository for God. Now the simple understanding of that Midrashic text is as the Sefer Likute, Bater Likute brings, and this I just brought this from source number eleven, quoting the Likute Amorim from the uh, from the free or from the uh, from the first from the Balatanya, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, who writes, "Ki um, habayit uh, etamakom alav nivne," using a, using a metaphor that a house, when you build a house, you need the land in order to place a house on a piece of property. But so the, the structure that I'm living in benefits from the real estate, the ground that the house is resting upon. But the ground gets no benefit from the house that is resting upon it. So in that sense, we say that God is like the ground, God is like the real estate, and the, the structure of our universe rests upon God, is completely dependent upon God, and benefits from God's uh, emanations to give it its existence and its motion, but God in no way benefits from the universe that he created. And in this particular context, the discussion uh, in, uh, in Pirkei Avot that the Sefer Likutei Bater Likutei is giving has to do with how we're supposed to approach God in prayer and understand that God has no dependence upon our prayer whatsoever. But uh, and God is completely uh, in need of nothing from us. But that's a, a separate discussion. But as it applies to the Rambam's philosophical approach to what he's talking about is God is the prime mover, what he's, he's not only encompassing this idea that God is, does not need our world, 
but also that, as he's going to to point out, after quoting this medrash, this is literally what they say. Consider it, and it shall become clear to you how they explained his relation that he be exalted to heaven. That it it is his instrument by means of which he governs that which is existent. It is God's orchestration, God riding and controlling all that exists to the point we say that God is the place where the world resides. In other words, the world is completely dependent upon God for its existence and God is constantly in control. Not only is he the repository for the universe, but he is in constant control of the universe to give it motion and to give it life and to manipulate it and dominate it as he sees fit. For whenever you find that according to the sages, may their memory be blessed, there exists one thing in one particular heaven and another thing in another, the meaning of the passage, and now he's really trying to explain, let's now break down what the, what the Talmudic text really means when it talks about all of these things that are contained in Aravot. And we said that God is immediately outside of Aravot or riding on top of Aravot, which means that he controls what is contained in all of these seven heavens. The most immediate or that which is most proximal to God are the things that are contained in Aravot. And now he wants to dispel sort of a more um, provincial understanding of that passage in Talmud. What does it mean when the Talmud says that these items, which we said tzedek and mishpat and uh, and all of these other things, ginzei chayim and ginzei shalom, storehouses of life, storehouses of peace, storehouses of blessing, the souls of the righteous, etc. What does it mean when it says that those, those things are contained in Aravot? He says the meaning of the passage is not that in that particular heaven there are to be found bodies other than that heaven, right? In other words, this is a completely ethereal plane which does not contain any uh, separate components, right? But rather, the forces generating the particular thing in question and safeguarding its order come from that heaven. And that's really, again, this Neoplatonic view that these celestial spheres, through their motion, emanate and bring about the existence of that which God ultimately intends for our universe. And so because God is the the unmoved mover and the prime mover of Aravot, all of the things that Aravot emanates are indirectly a product of God's movement of Aravot. And just to prove it, he says, it basically the term that the Talmud uses when it talks about what is contained in Aravot, he says, Shebo. The word Shebo, which is contained here in this Talmudic text, where, right where my cursor is, Shebo Tzedek Mishpat Utztaka, etc. Shebo could mean that contained in it, or it could also mean that via this Aravot, these things come into being, these things come into existence. And it is clear that not one of all of the things that have enum been enumerated here is a body, and therefore to be located in a place. All of these things are esoteric concepts. They're not really actual physical things. The only thing that you might think is an actual physical thing is one item on that list is the tal, the dew that God will use to resurrect the dead. But he says even the dew is not the dew, the dew denoted by the word in its external meaning. Consider that they said in this passage, shabo, I mean to say that the things mentioned are in Aravot, and they did not say that the things are upon it. Thus they have, as it were, given the information that these things existent in the world only exist because they proceed from forces coming from the Aravot of God, may he be exalted, who causes the Aravot to be their first origin and who situated them in it. And finally, just the last sentence before we close it for today, among these things are the treasures of life. Now, one of the things that are mentioned is, um, as far as this list, he says, Ginzei Chayim, the treasures or the storehouses of life. Now, that's a very um, cryptic kind of statement, but he says, in fact, it is correct and the absolute truth to say that every life ex existing in a living being only proceeds from that life, as I shall subsequently mention. And the Rambam says, hang on, I'm going to explain this terminology of Ginzei Chayim, but ultimately, you know, just as a forspice, what it means is essentially that this force that exists within our avot that was mo that is controlled by God is the cause of all living organisms in our world. Anything that has life 
comes from this sphere, this outermost sphere that is closest to God called Aravot, and it is that sphere through its motion gives rise to living things. And living things doesn't just mean physically living things, but it means anything endowed with the soul, including the angels. And we're going to get to that when we get to chapter 72, as Pines points out to us, and we'll, we'll see a little bit more of it in section two as well. Uh, this is where we're going to hold it for today, because we're going to discuss two more important topics to finish chapter 70 next time, God willing. One of them is to try and explain what all of these terms of spiritual entities that the Talmud says in Chagiga exist in Aravot. The Nishmatan Shel Tzadikim, the souls of the righteous, Ruchot and Nishamot Sha'atid Lihibarot, spirits and souls that are eventually going to be created, that is also contained in Aravot, and the Ramah will have to explain to us a little bit more what those things mean. And the other thing is that um, the last thing that we're going to do uh, when we finish chapter 70 is to look into a passage in Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer, which uh, continues to expand on this idea of Aravot and talks about the chariot of God, um, this Kisei HaKavod, the throne of glory, which the Talmud also says is something that is that dwells within Aravot because it is ultimately the throne which God resides or rides upon uh, in uh, uh, above Aravot. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the um, the chariot. We'll talk a little bit about these spiritual entities that are described, and that will be how we finish chapter seventy, which we'll see God willing next week. Uh, questions, comments, and again, I want to apologize for the sort of uh, shifts in time over the last few weeks, uh, based upon my current schedule, we will be able to, can, uh, to move forward at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, which is 2.30 Israel Time. Uh, and those, if you if you did miss the first part of the shiur today, you can catch it either on Web Yeshiva or you can just catch it on Facebook um, in the webyeshiva.org Facebook page. Hope everyone has a great day and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi.